in watching yesterday's Raw, I realized that the WWE has done something to me that it hasn't done ever really. It's made me turn off the TV and do something else. Usually when I see television, no matter how bad it gets, like a Raw or a SmackDown, I try to see through, unless I have something to actually do. I don't actually look, go out there and search for things to do. When that show is on, when either one of those shows is on, I focus on that. I make that my priority. But this Raw was terrible, which everyone kind of expected. But the reasons I consider it terrible, the first one being obvious, is the corniness of it all. For a Raw in 2013, I don't really expect this level of corniness. The level of coriness I received here is more fitting for a 2010 Raw, an 09 Raw, maybe even an 11 Raw or a 12 Raw when the WWE was more enamored in the fact that it was PG and the fact that they could be risque but they had to be more subtle about it. They wanted to leave an avenue for the kids. And I understand the flexibility in a PG program television show. But I also know that this isn't good TV. This Raw was pre recorded, it wasn't live because everyone was taking a well deserved break from their. 300 day a year's work schedule and this is just trash it was infantile, it was lazy it was terrible to watch the singing aspect with Xavier Woods and R-Truth's terrible ad-libbing or and then when 3MB came in, they started saying, Hey, that was terrible. And they sang their holiday tunes. That was when I turned off the TV. I couldn't take it anymore. And this, well, like the previous free television shows, is chock full of tag team matches. Remember the days when Theater Long made the tag team match the main event? Well, this is Pizza Hut's equivalent of that. Just three layers, three hours of tag team. Which is terrible because the WWE, as much as I appreciate the fact that they're trying to restore the division, they make all their tag team matches the same exact way. You have... The heel corner, which is ironically the corner that has better teamwork and less ego. And they do a good job of controlling the weaker face, making him stuck on their side so they can keep tagging in and staying fresh and leaving him weak. Then he does a reversal to one of their signature moves or finisher moves. And then both of them get the tag in. The other face, the strong link, starts wiping out the competition. And then as soon as the finishers kick in, it goes all Vince Russo WCW. And things hit the wall. Stuff, bodies start flying. Shit go, it gets real. And that's the end of that. That's every tag team match. So if you want to see if 
you're so used to this kind of storytelling for a tag team match because WWE watch the original Survivor Series 5-on-5 five five match between Hogan's team and on the Grace team, the main event of Survivor Series, the first one, in 1987. And then watch the match between the Mega Powers versus the Mega Bucks in 98 SummerSlam. Because when you see both those events, you're going to see 80s wrestling. It's more simple, but nonetheless, the storytelling was different from now. They weren't doing the same old, same old, and you can focus on that. The way the match played out, it was actually kind of interesting, because for the latter, the faces managed to win in a cheap fashion. And with the former, he managed to get an interesting sort of face squash. Where it ended up being a one on three with one face versus three heels. And that played off in an interesting fashion. And going into why I think this was especially terrible as Raw. I want to compare it to the previous Raw storyline and the previous SmackDown storyline. With the previous Raw storyline, you had. Well, let's focus on this one actually. The main story for this match is undoubtedly the Good Santa versus Bad Santa routine, which. They try to hype up the fact that the Damien Sandal character wanted to cancel Christmas and it's up to Black Santa, I mean Good Santa, to put a stop to that, to protect Christmas or something ridiculous like that. Something lazy, phoned in, and... I wasn't really impressed. It's just two doofuses with a uh, with nicely groomed beards, as opposed to the hipster beards the Wyatt's and Daniel Bryan have. The previous Raw had the storyline where the eight day face Del Rio accidentally ran over Santa Claus. John Cena felt he had to take initiative, and they had a main event Miracle on 34th Street match, which <laughs> was boring, minus the bowling ball to the testicles part. That was actually entertaining. Ish. Yeah, I'm bringing that back from the 90s. And then the previous one, the SmackDown, actually, which was my favorite that had the McFoley storyline, a shitty ass the Hornswoggle storyline, where he finally speaks, even though I don't want to hear or see from that midget anymore. I mean, they should just stick to porn. Okay, I'm not going to say something mean like that. Hornswoggle should just stick to porn or debut in it. Everyone else, keep doing your thing. I don't want to offend the midget drug dealer that actually lives a block in front of my grandma's. Actually, he lives in the same block as my elementary school. <laughs> Go figure. There was a midget drug dealer. And he has a gang that's been with him for a decade. I actually decked that guy during my Thanksgiving break in 2004, 2005. I'm an asshole.
I'm sorry, guys. Not everything I'm saying is true. The matches were a lot better in 2011. That Miracle on 34th Street match with Randy Orton and David Otunga was awesome because... Okay, I'm not going to say it's awesome. It's three-star quality because both of them were making a SmackDown-level match. So there's less of a standard. I can see some goofier storytelling. I know the writers are different. And the way to tell in-ring stories is a little different on SmackDown. I tend to notice a few discrepancies. Especially when I see a SmackDown rematch on Raw or a Raw rematch on SmackDown. I can tell. And I was very much entertained. I like Mick Foley's presence and role in all of this. My favorite match was definitely a 2011 one. Where 2012 was the easily the most forgettable and this one I couldn't even watch all the way through. I couldn't stomach it. And really what made SmackDown 1 better is the fact that it was a two-hour program where both the holiday-themed Raws are three-hour programs, which brings up a truth that Raw has finally gotten used to three-hour programming except for themed shows for some reason. When there's a theme attached, all of a sudden they lose all their skill and booking and start going lazy and half-assing it. And you're not supposed to half-ass a three-hour show. A two-hour show you can half-ass and make a holiday theme. A three-hour show you can't. You have to work twice as hard for 50% more programming. Since if you add half to two, two and two, one and one half, essentially, the equation, you get three. So busting your ass a little harder than usual. But I'm not going to be too critical because they've promoted that Batista is going to come back. And if Batista is going to come back, then that means that they can... they can promote his movies the way The Rock promoted his movies and you can have him do a couple of interesting cards I know that with the past few storylines you could definitely incorporate him into past feuds he had an excellent match with Daniel Bryan that not a lot of people will remember he had feuds with both Cena and Orton, and he's got the main event down to a science. You even got guys like Triple H and Shawn Michaels that have secondary roles in all of this. They're the over the head authorities, and Matisse's had backstory with both of them indefinitely. So, what I have to say is, I honestly can't wait until that raw happens because holiday programming just isn't for me anyway this is Mr. Wonka 7 and respect the king